it's a finite set, the enumerator is going to stop. The machine is going to shut down. You, you can, I, can, I, can, I can convince you of that without any loss of generality. Because if it was a finite set, I could write the enumerator to stop. I mean, it's... Yeah. Can you build an enumerator without an extension? Sure, sure. I mean, I could, I could send you home, you know, as a homework problem, write an enumerator that, here's a real simple one, that uh, enumerates zero star. So it goes on the tape without any input, puts a zero down, puts a funny pound sign down, and then, you know, counts in its head that it's up to two, and then it goes zero, zero, counts in its head that it's up to, for example. It's a little harder to enumerate other things, but but you could enumerate any of these sets if you can write a machine to accept them. All right, so I think we're ready to, we're going to finish today. We've got another maybe 15 minutes or so. We're going to finish today with, with an example, an example that I need you to engage in. Otherwise, it's just going to be like just too, uh, too detailed. We're really going to get down into the, into the dirt here of Turing machines. All right, so hopefully Sunday, please, Sunday we'll have our lecture at 1. Come with your head all clear, have a nice breakfast, then relax, and then come in. Sunday is, is, is the most, uh, it's like the crucial theorem of the whole undecidability, the first undecidable problem. And I'm going to do it from scratch, reviewing the stuff we did about finite state machines, assuming you've never seen the examples all before, and, and it'll really clarify what I hope is the most important theorem in this whole um, area. But now we're going to do something exactly the opposite. We're going to get something that isn't particularly interesting, but will give you some idea about how to write Turing machine programs. Here's a language, 0 to the n, 1 to the n squared. This is not a context-free language. You can prove it's not context-free with the pumping lemma. But it is acceptable by a Turing machine. You could certainly write your own program in Scheme or whatever to accept this. You could do a counting, you can do a loop, there's a lot of ways to do it. But we have a Turing machine. So I'm going to give you my strategy for this rather than ask you for a strategy. And then you're going to help me implement this strategy. Here's what I'm going to do. We're going to start with this machine. And the first thing we're going to do, just to make sure, see, well, here's what we're going to do. First thing we're going to do is mark off these zeros one by one. And every time we mark off a zero, we're going to copy all these zeros to the other side. So my idea is that I'm going to try to copy n zeros n times so that when I'm all done, I'll have 0 to the n squared here. And then I'll run my, then I'll move it back to this point, and I'll run my 1 to the n, 0 to the n checker on it that I did yesterday. Everyone understand that? I'm going to go through these symbols one at a time. Every time I look at one of these symbols, I'm going to go back and copy them all on the other side. So I'm going to copy n symbols n times. I'm going to get n squared zeros hypothetically on this side. And then I'm going to check whether the number of 1's here is the same as the number of zeros there. So I'm basically going to square this number, see if it's the same as the number of ones. Okay? How else do you want to do it? Well, you have a blank, right? It's another symbol. There's a blank on the end of this. You have tons of blanks, right? You have like, if you add a special character, you can just overwrite the ones and make sure your zeros run out at the same time you run out of ones. If you overwrite two uh, ones. I could do that. Sure. Absolutely. I could, but then I can't go use a subroutine I did the other day. I could do it. There's a lot of other ways too, probably. And there, and there may be better ways in this strategy. But it's just one strategy and one good example of how to use Turing machines. What you're going to see here is you're going to see a double loop, a nested loop. And you're going to see that loop in the Turing machine program. I want you to realize that Turing machine programs look like your programs. You're going to have a for loop inside of a for loop. And there's going to be variables here, the variables that kind of store where we're up to and overwrite. And there's going to be a little data structure, kind of an array of symbols that we keep writing over. And it's going to get kind of complicated, but, but conceptually not too bad. Just the details will be complicated. All right, so here's what it's going to look like after the first few steps. It's going to look like this. 0 to the n, 1 n squared is how it starts. Then it's going to look like this. x, 0 to the n minus 1, 1 to the n squared, 0 to the n. Okay, that x means that we've seen one zero, we marked it off, and we copied n zeros to the other side. What's the next big step? This is a few steps to get to there. You're going to go through the loop again. It's going to look like this. Two x's. How many zeros? 
n minus 2, n squared 1s, and, and 2 n zeros. And every single time I put another x there, I'll get another n zeros on the right side. Now I know, I, sure this is going to work sooner or later. Sooner or later it's going to look like this. Sooner or later it's going to look like x to the n, 1 to the n squared, and 0 to the n squared. And at that point, I'll move my head back over here, and I'll check to see if the number of 1s here is the same as the number of zeros here, like I did the other day. And if it is, I'll stop and say I accept. Are there questions about that? That's our plan. That's our strategy. The detail is always, like in any kind of programming problem, uh, unravel some issues. So you have to know how much n is. You have to know how many zeros you have right at the very beginning. Is that right? Because for every zero you encounter, you move over, you add n zeros to the end. That's right. So you have to like, count them up beforehand. Well, what we're going to do is we're actually going to scan them one at a time and move them over. And when we come back to scan them again, we'll change the first 0 to an x. That's one way. There's a lot of different ways. We're not going to keep a counter in a separate part of the tape like we would in a real program, because that takes too much effort. Not that this is lacking in any effort, as you'll see soon. It takes a lot of work to do this. Other questions about how we're doing this? All right. There's one thing that, that you'll realize very soon, and this happens a lot in writing this Turing machine. If I write in all the transitions at the beginning, you're going to wonder why they're there. So I'm going to leave some of them out and put them in only later on when you already understand why they need to be there. And the way we're going to write this is we're going to imagine we're doing the computation and run through the machine as we go. So let's get started. I'm going to need a lot of room, so I'm going to move this away, and this should be enough room to do it if I start way up here. Here's the start symbol. All right, how do I begin? All right, the first thing he's going to be doing is I have to read all these zeros and move them over to the other side. And then on the way back, I'll turn the leftmost zero into an x. Everybody got that? So you know what I'm going to do? As I move the zeros to the other side, I'm going to cover them with another symbol, with z's. Because I'm going to have to go back and forth to cover them. And when they're all covered with z's, then I know I've moved all the zeros over here. Then I go all the way back, past all the z's, turn them back to zeros as I go back, and then take the first one and turn it into an x. All right? So this idea of just copying the zeros from here to here is a big job. I've got to do it one by one, marking them off one at a time with a special symbol, which I'll call a z. Too many confused faces. Let's, let's expand this out. So it's going to look like this. 0 to the n minus 1, 1 to the n squared, 0. That's what it's going to look like at the beginning. And then the next step is z, z, 0 to the n minus 2, 1n squared, 2 zeros. Little by little, we're just going to copy them at a time. Sooner or later, it's going to be all z's, 0 to the n. Then we're going to move back, turn all the z's back to zeros, and get this. Are you leaving the x's behind? We've got to leave the x's behind, but the z's we can get rid of. Don't actually walk back across the x's. You you go to that last zero. Good. And you're happy. Good. Right. Start right. The x is kind of the index of our outer loop, and the z is the index of the inner loop. Mm -hmm. So the z gets reset all the time, and the x we have to keep. Mm -hmm. It's but like a local variable. To count up the x's from, <clears throat> because we don't want to only be copying n minus two zeros over. Right. So then you copy you copy the x's and the zeros. Right. We are going to have to go past the x's and think of them as zero still. Good. So how do you decide? Let's, let's do it. Yeah, let's, let, let, let's see what happens. It's a good question, but I think we should just get started and see. Right. I don't know, as you're getting, it's like, who the hell wants to do this, right? It's a, it's, it's, it's a mess, right? And, and, after, and it's not doing anything. Zero to the n, one n squared, it's just computing the square. I want to convince you Turing machines can do everything. I mean, this is... Not that complicated, but if we go through it, I think at least you'll get more of a convincing. And I promise it's the last one I'll do, unless you beg me to do another Turing machine. And if you want Dimitri to do some more, that's fine. But we're, gonna, we're not going to do more Turing machine programs. Last one. But, but let's finish it today and get done. 